Welcome to episode 213 of Your Career Podcast. Welcome to Your Career Podcast, the podcast where you will gain careers inspiration and support. You know how many people feel that something is missing in their careers and that's stopping them from really loving their job, but they just don't know what that missing something is? Well, in the Careers Academy, I provide the step-by-step process to help you to gain clarity of purpose so you'll make the right choices and create a career you'll truly love. You'll also find me on Clubhouse every Monday evening at 7 to 7.45 p.m. Sydney time, where we can get to know each other in my clarity and confidence for your career success Clubhouse room. So follow me at Jane Jackson on Clubhouse and visit www.thecareersacademy.online for my free resources to ensure your job satisfaction. Now, in this episode, I am very lucky to have the lovely Kayla Dengate, who is an editor at LinkedIn News, to join me. She's a journalist with proven digital media skills and a passport full of stamps. She's lived and worked in the Philippines and an Aboriginal community, and she's passionate about looking beyond the breaking news cycle. She loves using new tools to share stories, especially when it relates to travel, science, health, and the environment. Her career highlights include interviewing everyone from former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd right through to Snoop Dogg, as well as traveling on assignment to Fiji after Cyclone Winston and producing travel journalism about active volcanoes, camelback treks, and shark dives. Kayla and I met when I was named a LinkedIn top voice for 2020 in Australia, and she interviewed me on LinkedIn's Big Ideas project. So I'm very, very excited to introduce to you Kayla Dengate. Hi, it's great to be with you, Jane. And I've been looking forward to interviewing you for a long time now. I've been following your amazing articles and newsletter on LinkedIn, and there's always something inspiring. Anything to do with careers always gets me going. So now, as I always do in this podcast, because it's all about career transition and the career journey, can you tell me a little bit about what your early career aspirations were when you were a little girl? Absolutely. So when I was young, I actually wanted to be a herpetologist, which is a scientist who works with reptiles. Um, My father uh, was a biologist and a naturalist, so I always had an interest in all things creepy crawly. But the advice from my parents was, do you want to spend the day on your own in a laboratory? And I think they knew from a young age that I was a talker and a storyteller and probably herpetology wasn't going to be where I would finish (laughs) off. You know, I didn't even know the word. (laughs) Herpetology? Yeah, you're not alone. (laughs) How interesting. Oh, it'd be fascinating. Well, I think think the world um, would be a poorer place without you as a journalist because you had such an amazing career journey that I've, I've I've been following and you've got it on LinkedIn as well. Um, But you've made quite a few changes. So it's not just journalism. There's a lot of other things as well. So so from herpetology, you you made a decision and you got your uh, bachelor in journalism as your degree. And then tell us, how did your career progress from there? Absolutely. So in my final year of university, I was given a job at the Canberra Times, um, initially writing their wedding guide. And, you know, I was 19 years old. I knew nothing about getting married, but I thought, right, this is my foot in the door. And sure enough, I um, got a job there uh, just before I graduated. And um, yeah, the Canberra Times was where I I first got to, you know, write news articles. I I pitched my own column, which which got up and um, I became the fashion editor for a time. It was really my proving ground where I could dabble in all the things that a 20 year old is interested in. Mm. And you were, I think, the very youngest um, uh, columnist in the Canberra Times, weren't you? And you got to interview one of our prime ministers. Now, I I know you were there. I think it was from 2005 to 2009, I think. 
Sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. And so there were two pres uh, two presidents, two prime ministers. Uh, there was John Howard and Kevin Rudd. Which one did you interview? It was Kevin Rudd, just mm -hmm. as he was arriving uh, in Canberra. Um, and yeah, that was that was a real career highlight. And typical to my style, it wasn't hard hitting journalism. I was talking to him about relocating his pets uh, to Canberra, which you know I, I suppose I. I can do the hard journalism, but I like to tell stories and I like to get people speaking from the heart mm -hmm. and there's nothing like pets to do that. Yeah. And also, I think it's so important when you when you are storytelling uh, to get to know the, the real person behind their public persona. And, you know, everybody's human after all. And we tend to put, you know, leaders and politicians up on a pedestal um, and then getting to know them as, as real people must have made such a difference. But what a brave move at the age of 19. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, um, you know, starting starting my career at 19 was good because I had that um, naive youthfulness where I just think I want to be a columnist. Let's do it. And I never thought much about how people might um, might take my articles. I would I would just go for it. Mm -hmm. And it's it's funny that as you get older and more experienced, it's a little bit harder to put your hand up and say, I want to be a columnist or I want to write a book or whatever, whatever your ambitions may be. Mm. You know, you, you had an interesting transition, though, because then you, you were in the Philippines for a period of time as yeah. a lecturer for, um, now have I pronounced this correctly, Bicol University? Bicol University. Oh, Bicol, yeah. Bicol University. And, and you were creating a curriculum program there. Yeah, absolutely. So that was part of what used to be called the Australian um, Youth Ambassadors Development Program. Uh, so it was an Australian government volunteering program. And um, I went to the Philippines. Uh, it was one of those moments where my, my boyfriend, who then became my husband and I, sold everything we owned and flew to the Philippines and didn't really know what to expect. And I had the best year of my life there. And I think, I think it, was, it was the first place where I really understand, understood that it's not my job to fix everything. It's, it's just your job to, to live your life and get to know people and get to understand a little bit more about the world that we live in. Mm, what a great opportunity to be able to just pick up and move and experience a completely different culture. And yeah. how did you find assimilating into a new culture? Yeah, it was interesting. I, I love Filipino culture and I love the friends that we made. So I was really lucky that at the university, there were a group of lecturers who were so much fun and we would catch up at least once a week. And then the community or the barangay that we lived in, there was a, a family very close to us that we became really good friends with. So there was always a basketball game happening out the front or people coming over or, you know, somebody, you know, calling and saying, you know, we're all at Gustav's, you know, this bizarre German restaurant in the middle of Legazpi where we lived. So it was one of the most social and happy times of my life. Mm. And, you know, one, one thing that I really took home um, from being in the Philippines and being around Filipino culture is, is just that idea that, that you get on and do it with a smile on your face and um, put family first. I think that's a really important part of Filipino culture, that mm -hmm. your family is first and everything else flows around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know. I know with the, the Filipinos that when they have children too, they like to keep their children with them, even when they're sleeping at night. Whereas, you know, in the Western culture, we tend to try and get the baby in the other room as quickly yeah. as possible. <laughs> they, just, they, just, they just love family so mm. much. I think mm. that's really, really wonderful. And you learned how to speak Tagalog. Oh, konti, konti lang po. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of Tagalog. It was where, where we lived, so many people spoke English. Um, but there was a bit of a joke that if you were talking English, 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 they would just look at you and say, oh, nosebleed, which was like, oh, my head hurts. I'm getting a nosebleed from all this English. So, yeah, I did my best to learn, learn what Tagalog I could. Mm. And that's so important with, you know, like cross-cultural respect as well, because when you can say at least a few words in someone's language, they know that you care. And I think in today's society, it's more and more important to, to really, you know, you, if you're in a new culture, learn what that culture is all about. So Absolutely. Um, it yeah. must have been a great phase in your life. And now the Filipinas are very, very good musicians and yes. there's music in your life as well. So tell me about this music video site and how did all that come about? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I've just always loved music videos. And when we moved back to Australia, um, I started working at MX News in Brisbane, which I loved, but it was bizarre hours. So I was up at 4.30 a.m. and my workday was finished by about lunchtime. And that day's newspaper was on the streets that afternoon. So it meant that I had these long afternoons to myself. And I really wanted to get into online journalism. And I thought, why not create a passion project about music videos? So the site was called Music Vid Kid. And um, it was just a really fun way to get my head around online journalism and interview some of my uh, directing heroes. And I think that, you know, music videos, it's it's a little piece of art or a little a little reflection of culture. So mm-hmm. music videos was a great way to talk about art and music and life. Tell me your top three favorite interviews with musicians. Who were they? Oh, that is a really tough one. Top three. Um, I guess uh, I got to I got to be in a room with a bunch of other journalists interviewing Snoop Dogg, and that was interesting because um, he's just such a big name, and just to see him so at ease with you know 30 journalists staring at him was was definitely it was an interesting experience the same with Kylie Minogue um before one of her stadium shows uh I was with a group of journalists who got to go backstage and see the costumes and ask a very timid question to her yeah so that that was great um but you know in in terms of uh you know I think actually the interview that that was most kind of impacting from Music Big Kid wasn't with a musician, but with a director um, whose surname was Frost, who did the Coldplay Yellow music video. Oh, that was yeah. definitely one that really, really stuck with me. Mm-hmm. Oh, amazing. I mean, so, so interesting to have those opportunities to meet everybody as well. And as you say, as a young journalist, just being there and you realise that everybody's got a story to tell. So that must have fueled your desire and interest in storytelling yourself. Now, your, your, your career has progressed from the Sunday Mail to News Corp as a features editor. And then you went to Western Australia, uh, where you were the manager and curator of Woman, Wom, Woman? Woman, yeah, Woman, Woman Art Centre. Art Centre. Um, and then back to being uh, with, with News Corp as a digital producer. So you wanted to go digital as well. So that was great. And then the Huffington Post and then LinkedIn. So yeah. tell me, tell me this journey. How, how did you make these changes? Because, you know, going over to Western Australia and, and be, becoming a, a museum curator or art curator is so different. So different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I suppose when we got home from the Philippines, my husband and I decided that we we didn't just want one job for the rest of our lives, which I think is it's very of our generation to feel that way. And we decided that um, we would give it three or four years and then we would go on, on an adventure. And we'd sort of been thinking, what would that adventure be? And I really felt that I didn't know very much about Indigenous culture in Australia. And that was certainly a, a blind spot in my knowledge. And, you know, my, my husband, you know, worked in the arts and we got in touch with a friend who worked at an Aboriginal arts centre and said, hey, do you have any advice for us? You know, do you, do you know where we should look for jobs? And she said, we've got two jobs going right now. Um, so it was another one of those moments where we sold everything we owned. We, pack, we bought a, 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 a big tough car and we filled it with all of our stuff, including a coffee machine, which was a real yuppie move looking back. And we drove to Warman, um, sort of up to Queensland and around. And yeah, working at Warman Arts Centre was just the most unbelievable experience. So it is, it is an Aboriginal community uh, with a few hundred people. It's a two and a half hour drive to the nearest supermarket. So we would get our groceries once a fortnight on a round trip where we would camp at a campground. Um, but the, the thing about Warman that was just so amazing was the people. And, you know, I think coming home from Warman, I still would say that I have a big blind spot of knowledge when it comes to Indigenous Australia, but I know what I don't know. And I think that's that's a really important lesson to learn, that it, it takes time to learn about another culture. And um, I feel like I've, I've just started my journey in being, you know, being a good ally for Indigenous Australia 
and for understanding what what some of those issues that Indigenous Australians are facing are. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I was just thinking as you were saying is that when I was in high school, one of the books that was required reading was a book called Walkabout. And it was all about you know, young boy coming of an indigenous young boy coming of age, going a walkabout dream time and all that. And I was in Hong Kong in an English schools foundation school and required reading was this Australian book. And when I moved to Australia, I, I told many people when I first moved here, oh, you know, it's so interesting, you know, when I was growing up, this was required reading. What did you think? And a lot of people said, I don't know that book. And I said, what do you mean? Why was it re- required reading for me? And I, I learned something that was so interesting and it's not required reading here. So I thought that, that was really interesting. So I'm going to find out a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Now, back to you, though. So with, with your, your time, you know, learning more and more and also the um, Indigenous peoples have such interesting stories that I think we could learn so much from. Uh, yes, so I'm sure that you've brought that into your journalism as well. So from there, you joined News Corp, or you returned to News Corp, yes, um, and then Huffington Post. So tell me about those transitions. Yeah, absolutely. So I um, came to work at my childhood local newspaper, The Manly Daily, and that was that was a lot of fun. Um, it was a smaller newsroom than I was used to, uh, writing on far more local news, and I loved it. It's, you know, if you, if you talk about storytelling and telling stories, um, the, the people who you would speak to uh, would, I, I suppose when you're in a big, big newsroom, you often talk t- to media managers who are very polished, who are giving you the quote and that's it. Mm-hmm. But community news is so much more about hearing, hey, you know, talking to the, the barista when you get your coffee and they tell you a story and you follow it up and next thing you know, you've got a front page story. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed it. I also really treasured the friendships I formed within that newsroom. Um, really, really wonderful young and old journalists um, who, I, who I wish I, I saw more often, actually. It was it was a really fun time. Um, but I went back to MX News uh, and two weeks later, the entire MX News teams across three three states were made redundant. So that was a bit of a surprise to jump jump on a ship right before it sank. Um, And it was my first experience with redundancy and I took it pretty hard. It Mm -hmm. it was not what I was expecting and journalism is an industry that's very competitive and I certainly had a feeling like, will I ever get a job in journalism again? And I hit the phones. I, the, the second that I got made redundant, I think I called a few contacts before I called my husband to say I've been made redundant. And I've got such wonderful former colleagues. And one of those colleagues told me that Huffington Post is hiring right now. And I think you'd be perfect. And I'm going to have a chat uh, to the managing editor. And then very soon after I I met with the wonderful Tori McGuire and got the job. And being part of the Huffington Post as it launched in Australia was a real career defining moment for me. I think looking around the room, there were so many impressive people with amazing backgrounds who'd won Walkleys and who had national profiles. And um, I had a bit of a feeling, what, are, what am I doing here? Um, but as, as things started up, we all found our rhythm and we all found our place. And the amazing thing about the Huffington Post was we really were told, write what you're passionate about, the way you love writing it. And if it works, the audience will find it. And if it doesn't, you know, we'll we'll work on what we can do. So um, I had the freedom to write about whatever I wanted, and that was a dream for me. I I loved every second working at the Huffington Post. Mm. And just being being with the Huffington Post must have been such a highlight in your career as well, uh, because you know it, it, it's such an interesting platform, and the opinions that you get. I, that's what I really love is that you get opinions from all walks of life. And um, I think that that's so important to be able to to read about and then come up with your own opinions at the end of the day. And Absolutely. then, and then between Huffington Post and LinkedIn, what happened? There was another redundancy. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I was redundancy. Yeah, yeah. It's all part of working in the media in Australia. Mm-hmm. So I was um, at home on maternity leave when my editor called me up and said. 
things are not looking good. I want to keep you in the loop. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and a week later, uh, all but two members of the team were made redundant. And it, it was a disjointed experience being at home with my little nine month old. Uh, and I suppose I'd spent a little bit of mat leave thinking about how I'm going to return and what types of stories I want to write. And um, it was a little bit like the floor falling out from under you. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was the second time I'd been made redundant. And I think you develop a pretty thick skin. And I just accepted that I was going to have to roll with it. Um, and a wonderful former colleague from HuffPost had uh, moved to LinkedIn earlier and I applied for a job there and it was it was quite interesting in the interview I realized how much I wanted the job and it's it's funny how um, when you're when you're switching industries or at least switching focus and you know moving to LinkedIn it's it's moving from a traditional newsroom to a technology company and it wasn't until I was in the interview that I realized everything about this job is what I want to be focusing on. Yeah, it's, I mean, very exciting, especially having moved into that digital space as well. I just want to ask you about that transition between HuffPost and LinkedIn. Um, with the dates, like you left HuffPost at the end of 2017 in December, yeah. which is Christmas time, which yes. simply for hiring is a tough time. And then you secured your role at LinkedIn in February 2018. So from December to February and starting at, at LinkedIn, obviously you would have been going through the interview process, yeah. but that's when it's cyclically so quiet with hiring. A lot of my clients always feel a little bit anxious during that period of time. How did you feel making that transition, having your role made redundant um, you know, at the end of the year in 2017 and then looking for a new job during that uh, usually quite emotional time of year? Absolutely. Well, I was on maternity leave and didn't think I would be going back to work until the following February. So I suppose I, I felt a little bit um, like I was going to give myself the summer off. Um, but I, I, do, I do relate to that sense of anxiety. Like if I was to get a job right now, you have a look on the jobs boards and there's nothing that you think, this is perfect for me. Um, but the, the way the timing worked out, I was doing uh, the interview rounds for the LinkedIn role. You know, I'd duck away at a Christmas party and watch my toddler, you know, rolling around in a ball pit while I did an interview. And um, yeah, it, it all happened over that Christmas period. I'm so glad that it worked out well. And now as a LinkedIn editor, you're doing great things at LinkedIn. Tell us what it's like to work at LinkedIn. Well, I, I absolutely love working at LinkedIn and the, the piece of my uh, job that I'm most proud of is a weekly newsletter called Get Hired Australia, which Jane, I would, I would say you are a regular on. It, it, feels, it feels like a community service. So it's, it's a weekly um, article and tips for job seekers. And 2020 has been such a difficult year for so many people career-wise. And I really feel like a community has sprung up around Get Hired Australia. And, you know, I, I love interviewing some of Australia's best minds about, uh, about career advice, but I also love reading the comments. It's the, it's the comments from everyday job seekers that I just love the most, especially when you can see people sharing their stories and having other people either commiserate with them or provide advice. Um, I think that's a really special alchemy and it's something I'm really proud of. Mm. And I think what's so good is that you can find Kayla Dengate on LinkedIn very easily. Just, just type in Kayla Dengate, you'll find her. If you Google Kayla Dengate, you'll find her <laughs> as well. Because I know that you have um, an appointment at 10 o'clock and it's just turned 10 o'clock. So I don't want you to be late, but we're going to have to have you back on the show again for a little bit more detail and tell us the inside story of you know LinkedIn and features and how you come up with your ideas for stories. And um, your Get Hired um, newsletter is fantastic. I really, really enjoy reading it. And it's nice to be able to comment on it as well. So thank you so much, Kayla. Are there any parting thoughts that you would like to leave with us? Uh, I, I would just say it is a pleasure to be able to spend half an hour thinking about my career. Um, Jane, if only you could interview everyone, because it really, it helps to give you a bit of clarity about your story, 
where you've come from and where you want to go. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. I really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your early days right through until now. And I'll have the links to find Kayla Dengate in my show notes at janejacksoncoach.com as well. If you enjoy Your Career Podcast, please hop over to iTunes and leave a review because that's how we get to reach more people. And if you need help in your career, go to www.thecareersacademy.online where you'll be able to find lots of online programs as well as one-on-one coaching with me. See you soon.